Right, welcome to week 14, which is the end. Um, so, slightly atypical lecture today to just round things off, uh, but there is some material to get through, so let's just do it. Mostly a wrap-up and revision thing, and filling in a couple of gaps. Uh, so, yes, slightly atypical. There's just bits and pieces of things that I kind of felt it was important to talk about at some point, but they didn't fit in naturally to the, the normal structure, so I've just thrown them in at the end. And a couple of miscellaneous things, not not terribly serious, just a bit of a fun way to, well, fun, I say. Uh, maybe I shouldn't promise too much, uh, just a way to round things off. Uh, so, one thing, oh, and uh, uh, yes, just for the record, we're now up to ten people that have made it to the end, so well done. And I realised what with the COVID restrictions being back on, many of you might have uh, decided to just stay home and not get diseased, but fair enough. Um, okay, so one thing I didn't talk about much in the course was optimization, even though if you do like real game development work, it's actually quite a big part of what you do. You're always trying to speed things up to just get as much content into the game for whatever frame rate you're trying to achieve. Uh, one of the reasons I didn't, didn't emphasize it so much in the course is that it's not, I think it's not terribly necessary for the type of stuff we've been doing. You know, these kind of small games, it turns out modern computers are fast enough that performance isn't like a huge problem, which is why we can get away with writing in JavaScript and all that kind of thing. Uh, having said that, did any of you find that performance was a problem with your, your project? You know, I was it ever too slow? we running into issues with um, maps that have substantial enemy count. Right. It didn't so much start breaking the computer, it started breaking the browser. Ah, yes. Okay. So, some, I don't know if the microphone picked up, but you, had, you were doing the Contra one, weren't you? Yeah. And uh, had some performance problems, maybe. And there was also someone else who did like a, a bullet hell game, you know, one of those games just where things are firing all the time constantly. And they had some performance problems, which it surprised me a little bit because if you go look at my asteroids thing, with that you can spin around with multiple ships and have them all be firing, and you get like, hundreds and hundreds of bullets, and it doesn't really slow down. But, you know, if you've got more game logic on top of that, it might be that if you do like a really heavy bullet storm game, that even with current computers, you would get some slowdown. And in fact, the team that did that, they had to improve their, their uh, spatial manager a little bit, you know, from being the kind of simple one big chunk thing that I did. They ended up having to break it up into multiple little subsections so that when you were doing the search, you didn't have to search for the whole map. You were just searching the, the kind of, a, you know, the uh, sector that was near you. Uh, so that was some, a case where someone actually had to do a bit of optimization work. But I think for a lot of the kind of stuff, it turns out you can write it in a fairly naive way and it just kind of works, and you don't have to put a lot of effort in. But, uh, but kind of real professional level games, in part because we're all competing with each other to put you know, more and more stuff in the game, um, there's a kind of race to like, how, much can you, how much can you get out of the machine. So we're always kind of trying to out-optimise uh, the, the competition, as it were. So it's a big part of professional game development. Uh, so optimization, what's that? Well, I mean, literally speaking, to, to optimise is to make optimal which is to make something as good as it can possibly be, which is usually an overstatement. Um, in practice, when we talk about optimization, we're just talking about improving things, of course. And the most obvious one is to improve performance. You want to make things faster. But it's not the only one. Um, sometimes one of the, the bottlenecks, especially on console games, is memory, because they tend to not have huge amounts of RAM. So sometimes we get optimizing to make things smaller to make them take less memory, which is actually turns out to be important. And, and in fact, sometimes by making things smaller, you can make them faster as well, because reducing the amount of memory you use tends to make things faster, for reasons I'll get into. Uh, or maybe you want to make things cheaper as well, which is a different axis of, of optimization. if you want to you know, just reduce the amount of time it takes to make something, which might be something you'd want to do. And there are trade-offs between these things. Sometimes uh, you know, uh, the, making things faster tends to involve putting more work in, which makes them uh, cost more. Uh, but so let's look at making things faster, because that's important. Um, so the old school approach to optimization, as I would describe it, was fairly simple. You would, you know, you would kind of write your code to make it do whatever it had to do, and then if you thought, okay, I want it to be faster than this, you would find a better algorithm. You know, you would go and find all those any places where you've got kind of n square type things, and you would say, okay, is there a trick I can play here to get this down to like a linear thing, or to reduce the constant in my my n squared? And if you get anything worse than, worse than n squared, you definitely want to have a look at it. So a lot of it was algorithm improvement. And that's where things like, you know, using quad trees and octrees comes up to speed things up. Um, and then you implement that, fine. 
Uh, the other thing is, look for redundant code. It's amazing how often, if you actually start to pay attention to a piece of code, there's redundancy where basically you're calculating the same thing more than once. You know, you end up like you're, you're calculating the area of this shape, you know, and you, and you calculate the area every time you do a collision check against it or something. And you start to say, well, wait a minute, why am I doing that all the time? I can, I can calculate it once and then store it, that kind of thing. Or even redundant code that's not duplicated code, it's just stuff that doesn't need to be there. You know, doing stuff you don't have to do at all. Like sometimes you'll find that in a big enough code base it'll be calculating stuff and it's like, I don't use that. It's been calculated as a side effect, waste of time. Or you get clever ones like, you know, you're, you're calculating square roots to work out distances and it's like you don't actually need to do that, just keep them all squared. Wow, 12 people, amazing. There won't be room anymore, uh, reaching the COVID limit. Um, so, uh, so redundant code turns out to be a really important one and easy to find, and it can include some really dumb things. The classic one is watch out for uh, doing really stupid things like rendering the same object more than once. You'd be amazed how often it happens. It's really easy to screw up, and you can just literally be drawing things multiple times. And of course, if they're opaque objects, you can't really see it, because you, know, you draw it two times and it looks just the same as if you drew it once. So sometimes checking for overdraw, you know, to make sure that you're not doing really dumb things like that, or that you're not, you know, even like calling your update logic multiple times when you don't need to. It's, these things are, are surprisingly, surprisingly easy to make these like really dumb uh, performance mistakes. So just keep an eye on it. Uh, and if there's redundancy, remove it. So that's easy. So that's kind of the way it used to be. Um, but it turns out in, in modern systems, it's become a bit more complicated than this. That, um, well, I'll explain. Uh, one of the big things that's made, changed with performance profiling works is the importance of caches. Um, I take it you've, you've covered caching in your other courses, so you probably get the basic idea. It just turns out in the real world it is really important. Um, so modern systems have got multiple levels of memory caching, so that memory that's very frequently used ends up being bubbled up into parts of the, the processor that are very close to the, the, the microprocessor, so they're very fast to access. Um, so if you do like a memory fetch, if you really go into memory, it's quite slow. But if once you've done it, it gets pulled into the caches, and then if you do it again, it finds them more quickly. That's the idea. Um, so that's what caches are. And, uh, and it turns out there's multiple levels of caching, everything from like on-chip caches to the point where you, you can even think of memory as almost being a cache for the disk, because when you load things from disk or virtual memory, you know, virtual memory is potentially kind of backed up on the disk layer, but gets pulled into real memory as soon as you do anything with it. Um, have you heard expressions like caches all the way down? You know, the, the, the all the way down idiom, do you know that one? It's used quite commonly, it's a bit of a joke. Um, so caches all the way down. Uh, so here's an example of a memory hierarchy. The, the, the registers that you would access if you're doing like assembly language programming are kind of the fastest thing, I guess. Uh, and then you have the L1 and L2 caches that are kind of fast on chip memory. Then you fall down into main, mem main memory. And then you fall back to disk, and then ultimately you're maybe things that are even further away than disk, like uh, you know anything you're pulling in over the web or something like that. Uh, so, so the idea is that in, in, in practical usage, you want the memory that you're working with frequently to bubble up to these fast areas, but they're small, so you also want to reduce the amount of memory you use so that it's easy to get it all into these small, uh, highly optimized cache areas. Um, the phrase caches all the way down is kind of derived from the old expression turtles all the way down, which is the, the kind of uh, the, the origin of the all the way down meme. Have you heard of turtles all the way down? Anyone know that one? How many don't know about turtles all the way down? Most of you don't, you do, okay. So I'll show you, turtles all the way down is this funny story, which is, if you work in computer science, you'll hear people saying the, the all the way down joke all the time, and it's worth knowing where it comes from. So turtles all the way down is an expression about trying to explain uh, the nature of the, the world um, this idea of like, what does what the world stand on? And the idea is, oh, it's been held up by a turtle, and it's like, well, what's the turtle standing on? Yeah, so uh, there are lots of versions of this story, and they're, they're very mythologized, so it's this, you know, myth mythological ideas of how the world uh, might be operating. If you read the Discworld novels, Terry Pratchett's kind of got a version of this. Um, so there are lots of kind of variations of this story. One that a lot of people know is um, the one that uh, Stephen Hawking used in his book, where he says this. So it's actually Bertrand Russell. Do anyone know who Bertrand Russell is? He's a great mathematician. And, uh, so he's often invoked, although he himself used the story in one of his, in one of his uh, publications. So this is not really true. It wasn't really Bertrand Russell, but it's often credited to him. Anyway, a well-known scientist, some say it was Bertrand Russell, 
once gave a public lecture on astronomy. He described how the Earth orbits around the Sun and how the Sun in turn orbits around the center of the galaxy. At the end of the lecture, a little old lady at the back of the room got up and said, what you have told us is rubbish. The world is really a flat plate supported on the back of a giant tortoise. The scientist gave a superior smile before replying, but what is the tortoise standing on? You're very clever young man, said the old lady, but it's turtles all the way down. Uh, so whenever there are stories about like infinite regress or very st tall stacks of things, this is, this is what people say. So that's where that joke comes from. Right, yes. Uh, so getting things into cash has a huge impact on the performance of real systems. It turns out that uh, getting stuff from memory, memory t turns out it didn't, the clock speeds for memory haven't scaled as well as the clock speeds for microprocessors. When I started in the 80s, they were often kind of similar, like a memory fetch took about as long as an ordinary instruction, but that's not been true for a long time. And nowadays, if you actually have to go and fetch something from memory, it can take like hundreds of CPU clock cycles before that thing actually gets loaded from memory. So the processor is sitting there running at like 1% of its potential performance, waiting for, you know, waiting for memory to come in. So it's really terrible. Uh, so that's why you want to hit the memory early and get it pulled into the cache. And when you refer it from the cache, it goes back to being like very fast. Um, and it turns out that in practice, caching ends up dominating lots of other performance factors, including algorithmic complexity. Uh, it turns out there are things you can do where the dumb algorithm ends up performing better than the clever algorithm, simply because the dumb algorithm is more cache friendly. Uh, I'll give you a classic example of this. If you're programming in C, um, if you had a structure in C that was like a, you were maintaining an ordered list of something, right? uh, and you wanted to be able to insert things into the list at various times so you could do whatever it is you needed to do, the ordinary thing, the thing you would normally do is you'd write a linked list. Right? Because a linked list is easy to insert things into. You've got a new thing, you walk down the list, you hook it into the right position, you connect everything up and you're done. And algorithmically, it's like that should be good because the, the access pattern should be fast on a linked list. Um, <clears throat> uh, and what you wouldn't want to do would be just put them in a dumb array. Because an array in C is like it's all contiguous memory, right? So if you had to insert something in the middle of an array, what do you have to do? You have to take all the other elements and shuffle them all down. You have to copy all the, all the rest of the array, which on average will be half of the length of the array. You have to move all them down in order to do your insertion, right? So that's really inefficient. It's a, you know, an order N operation. It's terrible. It turns out in practice, often the array will be better because an array is a contiguous block of memory. So when you start processing the array, the cache pulls in the whole you know, pulls in chunks and chunks of the day. When you, the thing is, when you load memory, it doesn't just load the byte that you asked for. It will run ahead of you and load the next you know, 32 bytes or whatever. So uh, because an array is all contiguous in memory, you can load it in and shuffle the array faster than you could process a linked list because a linked list is a bunch of separate parts with pointers between them that are kind of scattered all over memory. So every time you load one in, it's a cache mess and it has to go and fetch the next one. So like every time you walk down the list, it maybe is hundreds of cycles of uh, memory loads. Now, in practice, whether this happens or not does depend on the details uh, of how you've allocated things and so on. But it can literally be the case that sometimes uh, very kind of dumb approaches turn out to be faster in practice because they cache better. So that's a thing worth knowing. Which means that you can't do it theoretically. You can't just look at the, you know, the theoretical complexity notations and work out which things are going to be faster. Actually, you have to just try, often you have to try it to see whether the caching behavior, which in itself is not entirely predictable, uh, whether that changes uh, the, the real behavior. So, because the thing about caches, of course, the, their state depends on the history. You know, it depends on all the other things the program was doing before it got to where you are, and how your thing interacts with all the other things that are also pulling in memory and doing stuff. And it's really, it's very hard to be theoretical about it. You often just have to do it and find out. So that means that, um, uh, it's hard to reason about performance nowadays. You can't just do it all theoretically because of this. And really, you just have to measure things. It's the only way to be sure. So it means that uh, instead of thinking so much about theoretical complexity, you just make sure you time things. And uh, the advice I would give you now is, for most things, implement it the kind of simplest way that could work uh, to get a baseline. Measure that baseline and decide whether you think it could or needs to be better than that. And then just do the work if you have to and compare it to your, your sort of simple baseline case.
So this has had the strange effect that there are various techniques that people know, maybe people of an older generation, that used to be optimizations. Uh, that nowadays, because of the behaviour of the caches, they can actually work against you and they end up being pessimizations instead. Uh, do, you, do you know about things like loop unrolling? Have you ever heard of that one? Yeah. yeah. So loop unrolling used to be a good technique and sometimes it still is a good technique, but it's not guaranteed. The thing about a loop unrolling, the basic idea there is if you've got a loop where you're doing some simple operation like this, the problem here, at least in theory, is that, okay, you're doing the real work is the thing you're doing inside the loop. But the problem is it's very small amount of work and then you have to go around the loop. So it ends up being you spend a lot of your time looping. You know, a lot of your time spent jumping around and, and updating the value of X, which ends up taking, you know, a fair chunk of the time compared to doing the actual work. So you spend a lot of time on overheads. Right? So the idea of loop unrolling is you take your loop and you just sort of copy and paste the body of it, which normally you wouldn't do, but this one exceptional reason that you do it. The idea here is you know you're diluting the overhead, because this loop now makes five times fewer iterations, so five times fewer jumps, and spends more of its time doing real work. So it used to be that this was a way of making loops faster, because they spend more of their time doing real work and less of their time doing jumps. And jumps are quite slow, by the way, especially if the, if the processor doesn't, uh, can't predict the jump. I um, don't know if you know about loop prediction, but it's a big thing in modern systems. So it used to be that this was a good idea. The problem is that nowadays, because copying this code means it's more code, uh, it's not just data that lives in a cache, the code itself gets cached. There's a, a cache for instructions. So by making the code bigger, you might make the, the instruction cache less, less efficient. So sometimes this doesn't optimise things anymore. It can slow them down and, uh, and it just kind of depends. So it's, it's hard to know. Uh, yeah. So uh, again, that's what I recommend. Just, just do things in a fairly simple way um, to keep keep it all kind of sane, uh, get some measurements around it. You can do things to access the kind of high precision timers in your system and wrap timing code around your key sections of your, your main loop and just look at those numbers and keep an eye on them and uh, use that as a, a baseline. Um, and that's, you know, so then you can look at maybe improving your algorithms or removing redundancy. But when you do it, be, be careful, check that you're actually improving things because it's just, it's not entirely obvious. Okay. <clears throat> uh, the other thing that can help with performance is profiling tools, which are quite widely available, especially on kind of more professional systems. Um, in fact, even with JavaScript, you can do this now. You can there's a performance monitoring on the JavaScript console. You can run a performance capture, where you run it in a special mode, and it, it tracks all the functions that are being called and it can time them for you. Um, Again, I won't dwell on it too much, but there are things you can do that will help to, to see what's going on inside your code. Did any of you have to use that? Did any of you know about the performance profiling and stuff in JavaScript now? Okay, well, I mean, if you, if you ever have to find out, I haven't used it much either because I've not had a lot of need to, but if you do something like a Chrome performance uh, profiler, um, there are things you can get. Uh, you can go in here and trace things, and it does stuff like this. Eventually, it can track uh, the inner behaviour of your, your code and give you some clues as to where your time's actually going. Um, so these are things that you can potentially have a look at. This is the kind of nice thing you get. You can get these kind of uh, time graphs where you get time going along here and functions going down here. So you can kind of see which functions are calling each other and which ones are taking time. Uh, and this is the kind of stuff that um, pro level people use when we're doing like C++ development. We have tools that do this kind of thing. So you can kind of measure what's going on inside your code. Uh, can be quite useful. Um, yeah, certainly, kind of in, in pro development, we use this kind of thing. You can either build your own system that does this by measuring and timing your own code, and I often do it that way just to get something that's exactly the way I want it. But there are also third party tools you can get that you plug in as libraries that help you to measure things, um, and they can be useful too. Uh, it's hard on PCs, by the way. The timing infrastructure inside PCs is always difficult to work with. Lots of like old legacy problems with the timers not being accurate and things, but uh, nowadays you can sort of make them work. You just have to put the effort in. Okay, so that was making things faster, but you might also want to make things smaller, um, reducing memory. There's some obvious things, you know, uh, just you know, don't store multiple copies of the same data all over the place, which you'll often find naive implementations might be doing that. So you just 
once you start to pay attention to it, you find those things and, and get rid of them. Um, there also can be cases where instead of storing some data, it might be faster that you just recompute it when you need it. Um, there's, a, there's always a trade-off there. It can go the other way. Sometimes you've, if you're computing a bunch of data, you could say, well, why don't I compute it once and store it? And it's like that takes burden off the CPU, but it uses more memory. And depending on the balance of things, sometimes you'll win and sometimes you'll lose, depending on the trade-offs there. So com compute or store is often one of these things that you, you have to juggle with. Uh, and you have things like compact data formats where you, you pack things into bits and everything to really squeeze memory. Uh, that's more commonly done in, in languages like C. Uh, but this is a little trick that I'll tell you that I have seen people use this in, in real development on games, especially on console games, as a way of uh, fighting the memory. Because consoles often have quite, quite limited amounts of, of, of RAM on board and they don't have virtual memory all the time. So you end up like, having really hard memory limits, and if you exceed them, the game will just crash, and you're in, you're in a lot of trouble. Uh, so here's the trick. Um, something's called prepared heroism. What you do is if you're working on a console game or something, um, and you're always worried about the fact that you know as the, as the levels get made and more and more art and level design data comes in, you're going to run out of memory, and you're not, you know, the game's going to like, crash and become a disaster, uh, which is very If it gets this, it's really painful, because if it turns out you know, you're just not budgeted right and you, you're using too much memory and, and you've got nothing else you can do. You have to do things like taking stuff out of the levels, you know, so you end up having to throw away work. You have to make the map smaller or uh, make the graphics lower quality and all this kind of thing. And it's like really frustrating. You know, people have put time and effort into making stuff and then at the end you say, oops, we've, we've run out of memory. And you have to go and uh, de-res everything. It's not a lot of fun. Um, so here's the, here's the tactic that I've sometimes seen people use. Um, at the start, Go and allocate a secret buffer somewhere with a couple of megabytes and uh, declare it as an important programmer memory thing <laughs> that is very necessary and, and hide that somewhere and forget about it. <laughs> and then when it gets to the end and you're absolutely desperate and people are saying, we can't get this thing out, we just need everyone had one more megabyte of memory. And then you go and find your magic file that you wrote on day one and you comment that out. And say, I've just done some great optimization, guys, you'll never guess. <laughs> I've, I've managed to save it's about a megabyte, I think. Uh, and they will, they will hold you aloft in their arms and sweep you through the building and you'll get a pay rise and everything uh, for saving the day. Um, obviously, there is an ethical question about this. <laughs> I, but I have actually seen people do this and do it like sort of admitting it. They seem to say, look, just, just have some headroom. We're going to, we'll get some headroom here and if we get absolutely... If it becomes like panic stations, here's some memory we can use if we get desperate. And so psychologically, sometimes it works to like wall that memory off rather than allow people to run right up to the very end. Uh, so it's a little bit strange. It's a bit of a kind of a, a psychological hack more than a technical one. But now you know. Because I'm a Scotty man from Yes, it's, 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 very, it's very like the Scotty technique. That's what you do. <laughs> You just set things up so that you can pull, pull out it at the last minute. All right, that's optimization. Uh, another thing I wanted to talk about as a kind of miscellaneous thing is just object orientation. Um, so in this course, I've, I've taught you to write your games in the O style. And I imagine that's the main style you're all taught. I guess Java is, is that the first language you get taught? So you're all very much. And, and, that, and object orientation is like the, the default way of doing things at the moment and has been since the mid to late 90s, I think, right? But I just have to point out for completeness, in case any of you go into the real games industry, that there are some people in the games industry who are not fans of object orientation, either because they never were, because they're, they're old enough that they predate it, or some newer people who've kind of gone off it a bit. Um, do any of you know what the arguments against object orientation are? No? Yeah. Make things more complicated, use getters and setters instead of... Yeah, there's, there's, generally the argument is that, that object orientation has got kind of overheads associated with it. You know, so some of the abstraction and everything that it adds, it's all supposed to be kind of structurally clean and good. It, but it, it's got costs. It can have overheads of having to call getter and setter functions. Sometimes um, overly elaborate class hierarchies can end up causing efficiency problems. Uh, sometimes memory allocation can be a problem if you're allocating objects all over the place. It can create inefficient memory usage. So some games programmers, particularly very performance-focused ones, the people who do graphics engine work, uh, think that, the problem, that there are problems with object orientation, especially if it's misused. The people who don't really understand it, it's quite easy to write 
bad object-oriented code that's got very bad efficiency problems. Um, so there's a kind of movement now in games to, to not reflexively do everything that way. Um, now I'm still basically pro OO, because I think it's a good technique in a lot of ways, but it is true that there are performance penalties that if you don't understand, they can trap you. So I'm just mentioning it for completeness in case you encounter that point of view. One of the classic ones is uh, object orientation would sort of teach you if you're doing graphics that you'd want to create like a triangle object and you go and create a triangle and all the methods that triangles have, right? And then if you were creating a mesh that had like hundreds of triangles, you'd allocate hundreds of triangle objects and kind of group them all together, right? But those objects are potentially disparate over memory. So whenever you iterate through them, you're jumping about all over memory and it's really inefficient. What an efficiency focused person would do would say, don't create an object of a single triangle. You almost never have single triangles. Triangles always come in batches. So the object you want to have is a triangle batch and it should basically be an array of triangles. And on the rare occasion that you actually want a single triangle, you would make that a triangle batch of size one. So you can't do it. But the point is make the batch the right unit that you work with. And that way it becomes, you have far fewer objects and they're more internally coherent because inside the object you've just got an array and arrays are efficient. So that's the kind of argument that you get uh, arguing against uh, excessive OO. So like I say, I just felt I had to tell you that. So one of the techniques that people now talk about is data-oriented design instead, instead of object-oriented. So data-oriented is when you think more about what the computer is really doing, especially if you're dealing with like, the GPU. You, know, you really need to know it's like, okay, look, the graphics chip wants the data arranged in this particular pattern, and to be efficient, you have to do it that way, and it has to be cache-friendly, so you end up having to design your system around the realities of the hardware rather than like, some super high-level abstraction that's all well and good, but isn't efficient. So if you want to know about that, you can, you can look it up. Um, like I say, it only, it only matters for some things, uh, but there are, there are situations where it's worth knowing about this. Uh, Mike Acton is one of the big proponents of this, uh, this way of doing things. So you can look at that if you really need to. Uh, something else I haven't talked about much is parallelism. Uh, so real modern uh, systems, uh, as you probably know, they're all multi-core now. Um, and the games consoles are multi-core and PCs are multi-core, but the way I've been telling you to do things is as if we've only got one processor, you know, where we go through and update objects one at a time, and then we render them one at a time, the way it used to be when there was only one processor. Real systems are a multi-processor though, so you have to find a way of dividing the work between them. Turns out it's a really hard problem. Um, the simplest version of it is, is, let's say you've got four cores or something, then instead of updating your objects one at a time, you could hopefully, you know, update them four at a time, and kind of keep all the cores busy. But in practice, because that means you're potentially updating objects simultaneously that might be accessing the same memory, you all sorts of problems with locking, you know, data races, which I think you'll have learned in other courses. So unfortunately, it's really hard to pull this off. But ultimately, if you don't do it, then a whole bunch of your chip is just sitting idle and not really doing any work. So modern games have to try hard to find ways to make use of the parallelism that's available. Uh, but it's a tricky problem. Uh, so, too complicated for this course, but I'm just letting you know that it's, it's a thing. Uh, I'm just kind of tipping you off that you have to think about it. Uh, in fact, if you want to know a bit more about it, I don't want to detain you too long, but there's a, like a, a talk here from the Game Developers Conference some years ago where these people talk about how they had to parallelize an engine for the PS, I think it's back at PS maybe 3 era actually, because it's a bit old. But um, it'll give you a bit of a clue as to what kind of real game dev problems are a bit more like. Uh, so I think the key part was about was it 30 minutes in, I think I said, yeah. So I'll just give you a, a flavour of it. Um, so you see here, they've got a bunch of uh, performance information about how they're trying to take the game work and divide it up amongst cores. But it turns out that even when you do that, you've got things that depend on each other. So one core is having to stop waiting for data that is being computed on another core before it gets ready and all things kind of a mess. Speed up. Um, and it turns out they're not hitting their 16 milliseconds per frame target. It's taking them ages to get things done. Um, and they do all the standard things. They try and like break the work up into independent jobs that are like maximally separate from each other, so you can just compute them on any core. And they do a bit of that, but it's not entirely helping. And they end up having to do some clever interleaving tricks. Let's keep working. So we kept dealing with the use of locks, removing 
we, we had had enormous amounts of locks in our engine uh, that we thought we needed, and they just caused deadlocks. Instead, don't kid yourself. Locks is not always the solution. You really need to look at your data flow of the engine, uh, try to remove those locks. So we got a pretty big speed up by jobifying some more, being smarter with how we're using locks, and we got down to 36 milliseconds. Not quite 30, uh, 30 hertz, but we're getting there. One thing to note here is this is April 8th. We shipped the first week of July. So this is three months from shipping. And we're not even running at 30. That's actually a bad situation, really. They shouldn't have let that happen. Well, we put in another uh, couple of weeks of This is for the last of us. And we got to basically this state. We're 25 milliseconds for a frame. We're running at 30. We could ship. We wouldn't run the way we wanted to. But at least we're having a solid 30 hertz. One thing we realize at this point is that we've jobified pretty much everything in the engine. We've spent quite a long time just seeing what's wrong with it. The GPU optimizations on the new rendering engine is going pretty well, and we're not really expecting that to be what's going to prevent us from running at 60. But we're CPU bound. And more specifically, the critical path is what's taking 25 milliseconds. We've jobified so much that there are these comic blocks that we can't actually break down anymore. But there's lots of holes on the CPU cores. We're not really using the PS4 very well. It's full, yeah. And at this point, we're only two months away from shipping. With the current rate of uh, increasing our frame rate, we will not hit our 60 hertz goal. So let's just take a look at the frame for, for a moment. There's tons of small to big and medium-sized gaps in here. Uh, we obviously want to fill them to, and try to compress the frame down. As I said in the beginning, we're running game logic first. That was so you see they're doing it the kind of naive way that I say, like, you know, do all your update and do all your rendering, right? But what they basically realized is that there's some time where the update logic just has to wait for other things to finish so it can't do anything. Um, and what they realize is, look, we're going to have to interleave the, uh, the update and the rendering, which you normally don't want to do, but they kind of had to solve the problem. So they end up, what they do is they, they do the update and then the render, because the render depends on the update. You can't, you, know, you can't actually interleave them. But what they do is they, they offset the frames by one. So while they're updating frame n plus one, they render frame n and the gaps in between. So basically, they, they interleave the update and the rendering, but they're slightly offset. So it's a kind of clever trick, and that's what they end up doing. That's the way the PS3 engine worked. So we're running game. That was the way the PS3 jump ahead till they the basically the show you the three engine worked. So we're running game logic here, colored in green, <coughs> followed by the command buffer generation, and various render logic, colored in red. Well. So we sat down, we took a bunch of other engineers and we sat down and said, what should we do? Should we just say we're gonna run at 30 hertz, parallel? That will do it, right? Parallel. I'm skipping ahead. Complexity it's in the more than me. simplified a lot. Um, we're basically now uh, thinking about stages instead of frames. So this is the old design. As we were seeing, it's the same picture we had before. Here's the layout with all the, the game logic and render frames. Here are all the holes. And what happens when we start running these two things in parallel? This. Boom. We are suddenly running at 15.5 milliseconds. Ship it. We're done. And that's pretty much the story. So they have to look. And this is actually quite common in graphics now. You often find that the frame that's being rendered is actually one behind the one that's being computed. So everything's been slightly offset so that they can have the rendering of an old frame happening at the same time as they're computing the new frame. So this is a, a thing that has to become common. All right. Um, right, so that's that. Uh, let's talk about the exam. Uh, okay, so what's going to be in the exam? 
I guess you're all keen to know, right? Anyone want to know or should I just stop here? <laughs> the old exams are available most of the time. Right? Yeah, that's true. Shut up. I don't like that. It's, it's, it's obligatory, but I don't like that. I think it's, I think it's, I mean, it's basically cheating. That's terrible. Because, you know, the course, can, yeah, the course is what it is. I can't change it that much. The, the world hasn't changed that much. Anyway, so I'm, no, I'm not going to tell you what's in the exam as such, uh, because that would be cheating. And if you came here thinking that I was going to, and you're very naughty. Uh, also, more seriously, it's, that's not really the question I want you to focus on, right? Um, the map is not the territory, as they say, and the exam is not the course. I don't like being overly fixated on exams. You know, the, the real thing is to like, learn, learn the material, right? Do that. And if you learn the material, passing the exam should be kind of be like an, an obvious consequence. But the more important thing is you'll actually learn the stuff, you know, okay? Uh, it's not all about gaming the system and just focusing on exams. Uh, exams are kind of annoying in that respect. Uh, so I just want you to focus on learning the material, right? The way you approach this course is, uh, if you turn up to the lectures or you watch them and you pay attention and you think about them, uh, you'll, you'll do fine. Um, and in practical terms, uh, if you do a bit of revision by going over the slides that are provided, that will help you a lot. Uh, so the exam is just a crude instrument to measure whether you turned up and paid attention to any extent, right? Now, I've got other things to measure you. You have the homeworks, so they check a lot of the practical element of things. And you have the project, of course, which brings all that together in a really good way. So the exam really just helps to do the stuff that's left over. So that's stuff that I talked about because I felt that it was relevant or interesting, but it wasn't like stuff that had obvious practical payoffs in the homework. So, for example, you know, I told you about Babbage and Lovelace, uh, but I didn't, you know, there's nothing in the homework about that. So that's entirely the kind of thing I may hypothetically ask questions about in the exam. Um, you know, I spent a lot of time telling you about Moore's Law. Again, hmm, interesting. Uh, not that I'm giving anything away, I'm just saying it <laughs> hypothetically. Uh, and there are other things that I taught you that were kind of technical, uh, like, you know, things like uh, the more advanced, like uh, collision detection and spatial management stuff, you know, all that stuff about all trees and whatever. But I didn't get you to implement one because it's a bit too hard and it's kind of overkill. But I do want you to know what they are and what they're for. So, again, that's the kind of thing that the exam would... would plausibly be about. So certainly the historical material, uh, because there has to be a payoff for that somewhere, and various kind of technical things, like I spent a lot of time talking about, you know, double buffering and triple buffering and all those things, but you don't really have to implement those because it turns out Canvas does that for you, but in real game development you have to know about that stuff. So again, it's plausible that those are the kind of things I would test you on, right? So that's what to keep in mind. So basically just concentrate on learning the, the course material and you'll do fine. Um, and you know, from what I've seen from the projects, I mean, you obviously have learned a lot. You know, the games. I was really happy with the projects. Uh, I think you, you know people have done really well. So I'm hopeful that you'll you'll do fine. Um, so I have some things to say about exams. Anyone know who this fella is? Noam Chomsky. Yeah. yeah who who doesn't know Noam Chomsky? Okay. So he's the, he's just one of the foremost intellectuals of our time. That's all. Um, he's not he's not universally well known though. But he's he's quite an interesting chap. He's, uh, he's known in computer science, by the way, because initially, back in the 1950s, he was a linguist, and he did some of the early work on like, the formal grammars of languages. So if you go and look at the, uh, the Chomsky hierarchy of languages um, that he's associated with, it's this thing where you try and work out, you know, just the way grammars are structured, and this led to these ideas of, like, you know, recursively enumerable languages. So if you ever do compilers and stuff like that, or programming language design, some of the theory about uh, languages in the formal sense that we use in programming are actually related to Chomsky's work from the 1950s. Um, I mean, writing like parsers for programming languages, or like I say, compilers, uh, things of that nature. You kind of sometimes deal with these. Have you heard of these things? You no know, context, context sense of grammars and stuff, right? Well, Chomsky uh, did that work um, as a linguist. Uh, and he's also like a, he's a, like a political commentator as well. He's like a famously an anti-Vietnam anti War guy. Uh, he's a kind of uh, analyst and critic of American foreign policy and stuff. Um, anyway, he's interesting in lots of ways. And this is what he has to say about exams. period particularly uh, 
an increasing uh, shaping of uh, education from the early ages towards on, uh, towards uh, passing examinations. Uh, that can be, t uh, taking tests can be of some use, uh, both for the person who's taking the test, see what I know, and where, where I am, what I've achieved, what I haven't, and for instructors, uh, uh, what should be changed and improved in, uh, in developing the course of instruction. But uh, beyond that, they don't really tell you very much. I mean, I know for, for many, many years I was on I've been on admissions committees for uh, uh, entry into an advanced graduate program, maybe one of the most advanced anywhere. And we, of course, pay some attention to test results, but really not too much. I mean, a, you can, a, a person can uh, do magnificently on every test and understand very little. I mean, all of us who've been through schools and colleges and universities are very familiar with this. Uh, you can be assigned, uh, uh, you can be in some, say, course that, that you have no interest in, and uh, there's demand that you pass a, a test, and you can study hard for the test, and you can uh, ace it, to use the idiom, do fine. And uh, three week, uh, a couple of weeks later, you forgot what the, what the topic was. I'm sure we've all had that experience. I know I have. Uh, uh, it's, uh, it, it can be a useful device if it contributes to uh, the constructive purposes of education. Uh, if it's just a set of hurdles you have to cross, it can turn out to be not only meaningless, but it can divert you away from things you ought to be doing. Actually, I see this regularly when I talk to teachers. I'll just give you one experience. So he, he talks about here about a child who was like doing some subject and they wanted to pursue something that had interested them in it and the teacher had to say, no, don't spend your time doing that. You've got to pass the exam. Just focus on the standard curriculum for the exam. And he says, well, that's terrible. You've, you've taken somebody who was interested in something, you've beaten it out of them, right? which is the opposite of what education should be. So anyway, I, I think I somewhat agree with him. Um, so that's one of the reasons I've kind of de-emphasized the exam this year. It's only worth a third now. I put more emphasis on the practical component. Um, because there are these kind of problems. Obviously, it has to be there to, to, to assess whether you've got some of the other points that I mentioned earlier. So, you know, we still have to do it. Um, but I would, I would prefer if it wasn't the key thing in your mind was just passing the exam. I would prefer if you tried to see what have we learned on this course. Uh, so anyway, from, uh, from one of the uh, uh, chief intellectuals of our time to another, <laughs> uh, this is what SpongeBob SquarePants has to say about passing exams. Wait, that would be cheating. Okay? Uh, closed book exam, no internet, no cheating. Just learn the goddamn stuff, will you? Right. Uh, so I'm not going to tell you what's in the exam, but I will tell you the shape of the exam, uh, which you can also find out. Um, so if you look at the way the course worked, like every week there was like a, a main theme usually. So there's about 10 or 12 big themes that are obvious, you know, like rendering and collision detection and networking, whatever. Um, and I'm going to, you know, I'll test you on a, a reasonable subset of those sections, four or five questions on each topic, um, and that's basically how it's going to be. Um, as I say, the exam is only going to be a third of the total grade this time, uh, so it doesn't weigh as much as it used to, but it's still worth doing it, of course. Um, might be some coding in the exam, but it won't be tricky, because most of the coding was tested on the homeworks and the project, but just to make sure you weren't like completely cheating and Googling every blooming piece of syntax every time you used it, which some of you obviously were, um, just make sure you can, like, you can remember how to write a basic JavaScript function. Right? You know, a function with like an if statement and a loop in it or something, you know, a simple one, just make sure you can knock that out. Um, I won't be super pedantic about like, the... the uh, the very fine details of syntax, but get it basically right, okay, just in case. Um, but if you barely get through the homeworks, especially the first, you know, the JavaScript homework that was just testing your big rudimentary JavaScript, just refresh your mind on all that stuff, um, because that's the level that I would maybe ask an exam question about. Um, <clears throat> okay, how to revise. Uh, read the slides, that's the answer basically. In fact, 
you know, the best way to revise for this course uh, is uh, do what I have to do. Write the exam, okay? <laughs> uh, the way I write the exam, because I don't teach to the exam, right? I don't, like, the exam to me is like a, a thing, you know, at the end. Uh, what I do is, as I go through and I read the slides, and for each week, it's like, it's obvious that, okay, there are a couple of big ideas about this particular, this week's subject, and a couple of, like, peripheral things, right? Uh, go and read the slides and think, what are they? What, you know, what was he trying to teach us? What was the point of all this, right? <laughs> and, and just try and do it. Try and, like, take each week's stuff, read the slides, and say, okay, what are the five questions I'm going to ask myself? And write them down. And that's what I'm doing when I make the exam. So you do that as well, and uh, it'll be fine. Um, so that's basically the idea. Um, I don't intend you to memorise like, lots of fine details. You'll notice that some of the lectures early on, like the historical ones, there's a lot of names and dates, and it's a bit fine. I might expect you to know some of that, but I'm not trying to break your back, right? I'm not going to expect you to like, know things to the exact, you know, what, what day of the year did so-and-so do something. Uh, for things like the broad sweep of history, try and get the years in your head. Have, try to have an idea as to, like, you know, when were transistors invented, and you know, when did Gordon Moore write his paper, and these kind of things, the kind of obvious anchor dates. Um, but I'll try to be generous about those. I'll often just, if you've got things to lick, you know, within a couple of years of a thing, that's what, what I would want you to know. Um, just what's, you know, what's sensible to have in your head about things. Um, so, yeah, I want you to understand orders of magnitude and chronologies. So things like, you know, knowing that Space Invaders was done in the 70s, um, and knowing that machines of that era ran at about one megahertz, you know, it's just that kind of ballpark stuff. Um, that's the kind of thing I would expect you to try and retain, at least. Um, so if you do all that, I, this is, I seriously mean do that, go through and read this. The other thing about slides is there are lots of links in them as well, right? But the links, how many of you have actually followed the links from the slides in your own revision up till now, on and off, right? So the general idea with those links, sometimes it's just me kind of like... Um, you know, showing my sources, like if I make a claim about something, like anything else, you shouldn't, you know, I know I'm a professor, well, a teacher, and you're supposed to trust me, right? But I'm only human, and the general principle is if people make claims, they should provide support and evidence. So sometimes my links are just, like, you know, links to Wikipedia articles that kind of back up the thing I just claimed. Uh, other times there'll be things that I kind of wanted you to read, like the Alan Turing paper. You know, it was kind of like, it'd be nice if you took the time to try and read it. Um, if, if you go through it, you'll usually be able to see which of the links are there as just like uh, citations and which are things that I kind of really want you to have a look at. So open them up and have a skin, get a feel for them. But generally speaking, the examinable material will predominantly be in the slides themselves, maybe with a few exceptions. But so for the most part, if you focus on the slides, you're okay. But read, you know, look at the links just to kind of get an idea as to what the context around the thing I'm talking about. But I'm not expecting you to, you know, go look three levels deep on all the Wikipedia articles and know everything. That's not the implication. I just want you to kind of get the rough idea. I'm not trying to, you know, I'm not trying to make you fail or anything. I want you to do well, but I want you to learn some shit as well. Okay, so that's basically the plan, right? You just go and do all that. You'll be fine. (laughs) No problem at all. Okay, so any questions about either what might, you know, the, what this sort of structure of the exam? Uh, we'll start with that. Any questions about the, that part of it? Okay, it's fairly easy then. So it's, it, it shouldn't be a big deal. I think you'll do fine if you've been paying attention. Um, it, broader, any questions about the course as a whole? Anything you kind of want to ask? Any other, any big things you think I've left out maybe? Not that I'll have time to do them now, but... Anything else you want to say? Yeah? Maybe in terms of the exam, mm-hmm. uh, is it going to be like one long written question? No, I'm, I, I'm going to try and keep that down because apart from anything else, of course, I'm forcing you to do it in English because my Icelandic is still not good enough. I'm, I've taken classes, but still not good enough. Um, no, the, the answers will generally be quite short. I've tried to design it that way. So they're short answers that are kind of, it's kind of obvious what the answers should be. There may be a couple of things that need a bit more. Like if I had to ask you to explain, you know, uh, what, what does du- double buffering do? It's like, that's maybe a few sentences to explain that. Uh, so there are a couple of topics where I kind of maybe have to ask you, you know, to write like a paragraph about something. But for the most part, the answers will be fairly short and simple. Um, so it's, yeah, not, it's not kind of essay focused. Uh, so there might be a little bit of programming, but not a huge amount. So you might have to do a little programming bit here or there. 
but mostly fairly simple questions that just check that you know that you you paid attention to what I was telling you when I was uh, teaching stuff. Okay, um, so if there aren't any more questions, what I'll do is there is a bit we've got a little bit more to do. I'm going to maybe take a little bit more time than I, I thought today. So I'll pause it here and then I'll just do the very last section that includes showing you your, your games that you've made. Uh, so I'll just stop this here.